Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we are sharing some game preparation tips that are specifically useful for dungeon masters who are also neurodivergent. We're going to be talking about our best practices as neurodivergent DMs, as well as sharing some of the comments from our amazing community, who in a recent Twitter post lent us a lot of useful tips and tricks for how they manage being a neurodivergent DM themselves. There's no one way that neurodivergence takes shape at the table, so we wanted a vast array of opinions in this episode. Now, one of the most common comments that we did get in that post was a general idea that the idea of a neurodivergent dun ma dungeon master is a little bit of a tautology or redundant. And I think that there is a grain of truth to that. Uh, both uh, Kelly and myself are neurodivergent, uh, but that neurodiversity manifests in very different ways, even between the two of us. So when navigating neurodivergence and how that manifests for yourself as a dungeon master, bear in mind that it's about building your own personal toolkit, and it's a big process of self-discovery. It took me years to understand why I struggled with certain things and why other things were very easy for me, and thinking that I should be doing things one way. A big hurdle for that is thinking that there's a right way to do things, and there's a way that things ought to be done. This, that's, this is the correct way to prepare for your game or run your game, even though that wasn't working for me at all. So with the vast array of possibilities, just keep in mind that today we're sharing our experiences and the experiences of those close to us and from our community. But we hope that you find some useful tips in here and continue to seek out what works best for you in your games. There's a lot to discuss today. So let's get rolling. However, before we get into the tips and advice, we do want to share, share that our latest book, Monsters of Drakenheim, is now available on Kickstarter until the end of April. You can find the links below to get in on the Kickstarter to get your hands on Monsters of Drakenheim, which includes the book Pluto Jackson's Monster Slaying Guide. This book is going to come packed with over 150 brand new monsters inspired by the world of Drakenheim that Monty and I created. This is going to bring to life some eldritch horror, terrible abominations, cosmic horror, dark fantasy, and faction intrigue to put into your games. Yeah, because it turns out that even if your brain is prone to catastrophizing and spiraling, that actually makes your brain really good at co cooking up not nightmarish monsters from your deepest, darkest fears. And we're sharing some of those with you in our latest book. <laughs> <laughs> not only will this book have a ton of new monsters with brand new conditions for you to try out but it's also going to include a ton of lore that's going to expand not only on the world of drakenheim but how to use these monsters in combat what their tactics might be their personality traits if they have them for role playing and a lot of other tools such as layers that you can bring to life using the tools in this book and even a new crafting system that you can use to rip the coolest parts off of the monsters and build amazing magic items out of them. In writing the monsters of the book, Kelly and I definitely applied a lot of the things that we find frustrating about navigating typical monster books and using them at our table. And so we tried to make monsters that were laid out on the page in a way that worked for the ways that our brains work as well. And so if sometimes you find that monster stat blocks are full of abilities that you never use or are just big sacks of hit points uh, or have too many things going on and it's not clear what you're supposed to be doing with that monster in the midst of combat. We try to put that thought into the way that we design and write the write our monster book. So it hopefully, if you are, do consider yourself a neurodivergent dungeon master, you'll find Monsters of Drakenheim and the creatures that we've created really easy to use in your games, whether you're running in the world of Drakenheim or not. So follow the links below to get in on that while the Kickstarter is live. But for now, let's get back to the episode. And it's just a disclaimer, Kelly and I are not experts. We're just two people that also have our own experiences with neurodiversity. And we're just trying to share things that work for us. Everybody's going to build their own toolbox of things that work for them and how they navigate being neurodivergent in the world and in playing D&D. So 
join in the conversation, and hopefully some of these tips are going to work for you. So one of the biggest things when it comes to preparing for your game is the question of how much preparation should you do for your game? And the truth of the matter is, is that whether it is you are a very high prep game master or a very high improv game master, both of these are completely valid styles. And it's more about finding the one that works for you and the prep style that works for you rather than thinking, I need to write 10 pages of notes or I'm not creative if I can't run my game off of three words on a page. I think that there's a lot of diversity here with the different ways that neurodivergent DMs take shape. And even between Monty and I, Monty does a lot more game prep than I do. A lot of people have seen my Monster of the Week series and praised my pacing and ability to work with that. My entire notes for each episode of those is less than a page. And I just kind of wing it. And that's that's the way that I have found most comfortable for me. There is a way that a neurodivergent DM can look at a page of notes that you've written during the game and it all just turns into a blurry mess and you can't actually make any sense of it because you're focusing on too many things. If you are a high prep DM, I would carefully consider your organization and how you are going to be able to look at it during the game and make it functional for you in the game. Sometimes this involves point form notes rather than big blocks of text. Sometimes this is writing out everything in a large prep way and then distilling it down to just the single points that you need to remind your brain of what actually needs to happen at the table. If you prefer a more low prep or improvisational style, one of the things that you might want to consider is your consistency, but also how much more mental exhaustion, having to come up with ideas on the spot can place upon you and where you might want to find ways that a little bit of prep is going to give you more energy during the game session and also sometimes how good you are at thinking on your feet and having ideas. I find for myself, I'm able to make low prep work because I have a bit of a mental Rolodex of archetypal scenes. So for myself, I can improvise what a tavern looks like because I've looked and researched at a bunch of different tavern maps. I can improvise certain plots because I've read a lot of books and I know kind of how to decide this is the novel or the story or the scene from a movie that I'm riffing off of. And I'm just kind of following the mental template of that item. And so even for a low prep style, there's a certain level of mental templating that you can do that still gives you a structure to operate within even when you're only running your game off of three words. To go along with what Monty's saying, I run a lot of Monster of the Week because I love horror. And the reason I love horror is because I am basically an encyclopedia of horror movies and I know how they're structured how they how the plots are laid out i can generally assume what's going to happen in most horror movies i'm delightfully surprised once in a while but then i catalog those surprises as well i've been praised for my pacing in my monster of the week series but that's because i've seen so many horror movies <laughs> that i know exactly yeah. when to pull what strings if you have a hyper focus like me for horror movies playing into that in your dm style is actually going to help you be a more improv ready dm totally and i'm someone who can hyper focus on maps and architecture and research and so my brain is just kind of holding all this information in my head right and so i know oh i really don't need to necessarily focus on those kind of details but what i do need is i need a map i need a list of names i need these things so this is something that you'll develop over time. And I think one of the best ways to really figure out for yourself what's going to work is try the different prep styles. Give it a fair shake. Try for the next one or two game sessions. If you are a high prep DM, give yourself the experiment and try reflecting on what worked and what didn't work. And if you are traditionally low pep prep, see what happens when you increase your level of prep. I think it's also important to consider visual aids. How many images, maps, and handouts do you need? Sometimes during prep, 
I will plan out what I'm going to give to my characters, what I'm going to show them, and what maps I might be using. This is all part of the prep. And whether you're a, a heavy prep or a low prep, you're still going to want to consider what elements you're bringing to the table as part of that prep for everybody to engage with. I think one of the best pieces of advice we saw in our community conversation was from Death Samba, who said, focus on what you can do not what you think you should be able to do. And I really admire the sentiment because I think that, you know, and even Kelly, you and I are probably guilty of, of, of this, is that so many dungeon masters think that my prep needs to look like this, or I need to do this amount of prep, or it needs to be X, or my game prep needs to look the same as the way that it's written in the published Curse of Strahd module. Do what you can, find what works for you, and don't let the ideal or like don't look at your notes and then go download the notes that Matt Mercer shared for for his game prep and think that that's the template that you need to be working from. In this respect, one of the things that is really interesting amongst game prep is what I would consider to be the tyranny of written prep and this idea that GM prep notes are something that goes in a binder. They are written down. They are blocks of text and bullet point notes. They are things that are written in a very specific way and that your and that game prep notes kind of look like they might be the first draft of a published adventure in in their most in the most malignant form of this. As someone who has written an adventure and published it and has also written game prep notes, I'm here to tell you that my written game prep notes look nothing like my published adventures. <laughs> and, and I can tell you that because the published adventure is an order of magnitude more than what I had in actually running that adventure the first time I was that we were doing it. Yeah. Yeah. When we're exploring alternatives to written prep, I think it's important to discuss the different learning styles. One of the most important things that ever happened to me at a young age when I was going to school and struggling with school was a single teacher who I had for an English class where I had to read The Crucible and then deliver a project on it. And I remember her standing at the front of the class saying, you can either write an essay or you can write a song, do a game show, or act out a scene from the book. And I remember asking if me and my buddy, if we worked together and did all three of the alternative options, because we were supposed to pick one, but I said, if I work with a friend, can we do all three? And so me and my buddy came with a song, a scene to act out, and a game show. Everybody else in the class was like, why would you pick that? That's so much more work than writing an essay. But for me, writing the essay was daunting, but doing a song because I love playing music was so much easier. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand that was one of the first times that I said, oh, this is because I have a different learning style than just writing things down. Totally. And, and this is an example of, of what we might call dual coding which means that you can have written notes that are supplemented by visuals. One of my favorite ways to prep my game is to print the map out and write notes on the map. And so what is happening there is a combination of point form notes supplemented and augmented by a visual. And you might even include sketches. You might even include drawings. You might even include a visual flowchart of arrows pointing in different directions. Notes that look not like a page that is very linear, but notes that look like the way the world of your game is organized, which you don't have a linear campaign, not necessarily. Things can go all over the place. Dungeon environments are sprawling complexes. So organize, so your notes might make more sense if they are kind of organized around the structure of the dungeon or the environment itself. And so this is, this is where uh, a visual element like collecting images um, and making a collage of images and that being your prep instead of written notes might work better for you. 
There are many ways to combine these elements. If you are a written learner, a person who uh, writes to prep, point form notes sometimes work better than larger text. Using applications for searchable organized notes can be really, really helpful for neurodivergent people. Sometimes looking at a block of text can be confusing. Sometimes remembering the names of NPCs or locations can be confusing. If you have searchable organized notes, I'm thinking of something like World Anvil or Scrivener, either of those are great tools that you can use to actually help you with your note taking. But as Monty said, there's the visual aspect of learning, collecting maps, sorting them into categories for easy access. I gather a lot of artwork to inspire my campaign and also to inspire my descriptions. Sometimes I don't write the best descriptions, but I can look at a piece of artwork and at the table, I will describe the piece of artwork of the creepy mountain cave to my players with I, I don't even need to show them the artwork necessarily it's there more so for me to see it and say you see a yawning cave and etc cetera, etc cetera. then there's also the kinesthetic learning style there have been days that monty and i have dumped out a bunch of dwarven forge and it doesn't need to be dwarven forge your map tiles your dry erase markers your minis your minis anything. dump it all out on the table and monty and i have been there to like put them together yeah it's like what what does this piece of scenery represent like for me when i build a dwarven forge setup and i put like the furnishings and the miniatures i am telling the story and i'm making that that a very physical map of what's going to happen in the game by putting down things like knowing oh yeah this i'm putting the cauldron in this scene what does that mean well obviously someone's brewing potions right yeah so simply by dumping out your minis, it even helps if you have a bunch of monster minis, you pour them out on the table before your game, maybe the day before, and you look at them and you go, well, what haven't I used recently? Monty always has the expression, whatever mini has the most the, dust. Yes, exactly. That's going to that's gonna be that. Now, if you don't use all of these things, it might be for you, your kinesthetic sense could be busting out a map making program like, say... Uh, this is where kinest the kinesthetic and the visual really overlap, I think, a lot. Like, maybe you're going to bust out Dungeon Draft and you're going to design your dungeon. Maybe you're going to go into Roll20 or Foundry and you're going to build the environment. And that is, it might actually be that the process of building the dungeon in your VTT or at your tabletop, that's the act of prep. And you don't need a lot of notes beyond that. An interesting way of acting this out could actually be talking through things and recording yourself with an audio recorder as you talk through your own environment and then playing that back for yourself. This is where the auditory prep can come into play. Or maybe you're just going to have music or a playlist that you just play for yourself that gets you in the mood. Ryan Omega on Twitter had a great comment. They said that they prefer to use bullet points of their plot rather than full pages of adventure notes. If they see blocks of text, they're likely to ignore them in the midst of gameplay. And the organization of your notes is everything. And this is why I find for myself that dual coded mode of the page of notes that are on the map is so much better because then I'm not searching through the blocks of text. This is like classic presenter stuff as well. Like if you've delivered lectures or talks like this, writing out your lecture notes in like pages and pages, you're going to lose your place. But if you've created a mind map or a flow chart, these things can be much more effective at the table as a form of prep. When it comes to taking notes, we've kind of already talked about it, but I think it's really important to use an application that you can actually search on. Scrivener or World Anvil, both excellent tools. Mm. Uh, you can also, though, ask your players to take notes as well. Absolutely. For myself, I am really bad at taking notes. And honestly, the best thing that ever happened to me was recording my campaign as an actual play. <laughs> and yeah. so now I actually have this, this repository that I can go back to. And I have a community of people who are taking notes for me. <laughs> like, it's, it's really amazing. I, I, I can't understate how appreciative I am to everyone who watches Drakenheim. Uh, and then is able to comment on things and talk about things. And if I post on our Discord or on our community, hey, what happened like a couple sessions ago and help me find those things? Because for, for me, the prep was always fine. 
It was the note taking and keeping the campaign diary that was always a struggle for me. And just recording the session ended up being the best solution for me. But also having that reference point of being able to then go back over, like, for, cause for me, I like that it's a video recording yeah. because then I can scrub through on YouTube and be, and, and like, know where you are. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll scrub through on YouTube on our old videos and I'll look for the Dwarven Forge setups because I'll usually, because again, this is where the kinesthetic thing is. I'll remember what the setup was. Right. And that's how I find what I said. And if I'm trying to remind myself of like a specific moment, right? That's where the visual and the auditory and all these things kind of collide. I love going into our Discord and just being like, hey guys, did I did I have uh, anything that could work with this? Or what was the episode? Yeah. One of our one of our Discord members, another human bard, is a walking encyclopedia of our yeah. lore and probably knows more than we do. And so thank you for always being there to answer all of our questions. Don't worry, everybody. The Rattling Submarine will come back one day. <laughs> <laughs> As we've said several times, Craig Morgan was the one who first mentioned on Twitter to have your campaign information in a searchable format. Yeah. They had a few recommendations. We should have an image of their actual tweet right down below don't forget to go to twitter to see the actual conversations around all of these but there was a lot of good suggestions for applications that you can use to keep track of your notes in when you are preparing your game um or during the game itself i find it's really critical to also if, if you are neurodivergent to consider what your sensory needs are what do you need to get into the headspace to prepare for your game. How, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Do you have a routine that you get into so that you can get that, get into that creative game prep space? I myself can get easily distracted by anything going on around me, whether it's visual or audio. Those are actually the two big ones. If, if somebody is moving around my space while I'm trying to prep, I lose focus. Or if I hear something going on in my house while I'm trying to prep, I lose focus. So for me, I need noise canceling headphones and I need to be situated in a space where I'm facing a wall with my computer screen there. And that is where I do my work. I put on instrumental music only. I can't handle lyrics if I'm trying to think and write, but facing a wall, instrumental music, noise canceling headphones, and then I'm in the zone and I need to yeah. get myself in the zone in order to properly prep a game. So I'm someone that can really hyper-focus, but my hyper-focus takes time to kind of come online. And then when it comes online, it's very, very, very deep. But if anything distracts me, as that focus is building and building and building and building and building, I have to start from zero again. And so for me, I, I like to nickname this track switching because I feel like my brain is like a, tr is like a locomotive, right? It takes a really long time to m make up max speed. And then when it's at max speed, it's really hard for it to slow down. And if there's an abrupt thing that disrupts it, it's, I, I, I mentally crash. Um, and so for me, it's very important that when I go into prep, I need to know that nothing's going to bother me for the next couple of hours, that I'm not going to have any distractions uh, or anything else fighting for my attention. Um, and oftentimes, uh, this is very frustrating because I have to turn off my phone, I have to turn off my notifications, and I kind of have to be like disconnected from the rest of the world. And that can sometimes be frustrating for other people <laughs> who are trying to reach me. But I I need that like it 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 it's a it's a real challenge. I I can never work with music playing on in the background. I can't work in a coffee shop or in a public environment. I I have to basically be alone. There's a certain like romanticization of taking your laptop to the coffee shop, but I actually I cannot I, I, stand I, the idea I, of trying to work in an environment like that. It, just way too overstimulated. Like, yeah. I need like I need to zone out from the world and Im and immerse myself in my brain. I want to tell a little story about one of the greatest things I ever discovered um, at the Guillermo del Toro exhibit in Toronto. I went to the Guillermo del Toro exhibit where they had a bunch of pieces of uh, art from his movies, but they also had this one section. It was called the Rain Room, and what it was is a it was a replica 
of Guillermo del Toro has a separate house that he writes his scripts in. So he goes to a separate house. It's full of art and a giant Frankenstein and like all of these, all of these things that inspire him. Then he goes into the rain room. The rain room doesn't have real windows. It's actually in the center of the house. It's an old library with his desk and his, his laptop or typewriter. And it has fake windows throughout the room that are projecting rain pattering against the window and the distant sound of a th and visual of a thunderstorm. And Guillermo del Toro goes into that room, closes the door, and works on his scripts. Oh man, I just and that it was that that feels that feels like heaven to me. Yeah, it was one of the most pleasing environments I've ever <laughs> been in, and I didn't know that that was an option. But the moment I went in there, oh. I was like, I get why Guillermo del yeah. Toro has this, and that is the perfect place to life, write your screenplays in. Oh, so man. my just, goal in life is to have a rain. Room. I just, I just want that. I want, I want to go to there. I want that so bad. I'm that was so my jealous biggest, of Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, like that just feels like such a per like that the patter of rain, rain. Also, if you if you think about the scripts that Guillermo del Toro writes or the campaigns that we run, it's yeah. it's perfect to set that mood and feel. Yeah. So Guillermo del Toro's yeah. Rain Room, I if you can sometimes I have put on uh the my noise canceling headphones and put on the sound of I a just, thunderstorm. I just worry that that would put me to sleep because I'm someone that sleeps with white noise. Fair. Um. And and that's and that's also like what I find like I find music distracting to listen to when I'm writing because there's there's so much variation that I, I but I need something that is just going to let my head be in one mode. On a note of this, I think it's also important to consider what your sensory needs are when you are actually running the game as well. Uh, we talked about this more in our broader notion of neurodiversity in 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 D and D, but. You know, again, for me, it's like, I don't want the background music there. I don't necessarily want the flashing lights. I like having the miniatures and everything, but think about what is going to make you feel overwhelmed and what's going to make you uh, feel focused and then take those breaks. Uh, Thea on Twitter said, have a set period of time after a session set aside to reset. And that is something that I feel very, very much so that like, I, I do find that with, with what I, with my like mental track switching i have to build up into the mode of running a game and then i have to slow that mental train down again and come out of that right and so both with prep and running the game itself having that ramp up time ramp down time really means a lot for me I've started to try to end my sessions earlier because of that. Cause I used to play until about 10 or 11 PM. And then if I had to come into the studio yeah. tomorrow, I need about two hours after everybody leaves my house to sit quietly. No, I, I totally, I'm like that just socially in general. Like a part of the reason why I don't stay out as late as I used to anymore is that when I'm out and about, because I'm an introverted person, when I get home, I need a couple hours of mental cool down time just for myself to even fall asleep. Yeah. 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 This also applies to at the table, not so much prep, but Matt Hopgood on Twitter mentioned that fidget toys can be incredibly helpful to keep you busy, allowing more room for role play from your players. I'm always playing with my dice. I yeah. dice are great. I actually, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this, but in my dice tray, I have a smooth stone. Um, I actually have that because sometimes while the other two are talking, mm -hmm. I pick that up and play with it because it helps calm my mental load down. It's this weird thing. And I think a lot of people who have fidget toys do this. If I'm having a virtual meeting, I have to have, I yeah. have four fidget toys on my desk and I pick them up at random and fiddle with them because if I don't, I'll actually do something worse, like start writing or going on uh, Reddit or something. But having a fidget toy actually helps me keep focused because I'm doing something with my hands and it, it, it just works. I have uh, in my dice tray. I have a couple coins, yeah. uh, like dec they're they're fantasy coins that are embossed, and I just find just the sensation of of feeling the metal and like the edges of the metal. That's like that's all I I, I need. But yeah, uh, you might just need something sensory in that to help you with that that focus. 
Now, we talked before about learning styles and how that can impact your game prep, but I think part of game prep is also finding inspiration and brainstorming ideas, and the different learning styles can come into play here as well. Monty always advocates for reading more books, and I do agree that we should all be reading more books in order to get inspired for Dungeons & Dragons. But I myself am more of a visual thought person. I get inspiration yeah. better from visuals. I watch a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows, and in a way, if I'm also slightly kinesthetic, video games are both visual and kinesthetic because I engage with them naturally using my hands. And so those two are where I actually draw most of the inspiration for the prep that I will do for my D&D games. I think the big takeaway from this is that as a, as a dungeon master, you do need creative material to mentally digest. And I think that the key takeaway here is just as everybody has a different diet of different foods that work for their tastes and the way their bodies work, I think that everyone's brains also have a different mental diet, right? And just as you know that, you know, the, Eating the right foods that speak to your body's physiological needs will change your mood, it will change your energy level, and it will change what you are physically ca capable of doing. But also, what you expose yourself mentally to and what, what types of media you experience and consume is also going to change what you're like, and affect what you are mentally processing. And I feel like if, you know, if, all your inspiration is the same, right? If you are watching just the same show over and over again, if you are only, you know, if you're only, I mean, this is maybe, maybe I'm, this is a self own here. And it's like, if you're only ever just playing Satisfactory in Valheim, that's, that's a pretty limited palette, right? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and by by the same token, it's it's like if the Lord of the Rings is your only touchstone for fantasy material, there's there's a lot more out there that can nourish you. But it's important to find the nourishment that speaks to the way that your brain works. I think that you can look at audiobooks or podcasts if you're yeah. an auditory learner. You can look at again playing with like Lego or your Dwarven Forge as a kinesthetic or video yeah, games. or toys, action figures, music. Comic books. Yeah. Movies, TV shows. I mean, I've, re I've run a session based on a song. I've run a session based on a movie. I've run a session based on just the idea of my favorite comic book character. Yeah, and I, I think that the thing... Here, here's what I... This is the thing that I look for. I look for the click, right? Um, I think that hyper focus is absolutely a thing for for many people that that feel neurodivergent no no matter you know whether that even extends into any of the more ADHD spectrum type stuff but when something clicks for you and you feel like you have to you know when you start eating something that is delicious and you're like I just I just have to keep oh yeah right uh, and uh, trust and, me and, and, I, and I with hyper media, focus about the weirdest thing yeah and with media it can be the same way it's like I have to finish this movie I have to, and like for me that's the thing with books it's like I'll start a book and I just have to finish it right like it's like uh, I I read a lot of books but it, it definitely becomes one of those things where like if I'm reading something that book is going to come with me on the, on the subway on public transit that book is going to stop me from falling asleep at night that book is going to be the thing that I just default to because until it is done I if if you're neurodivergent like me uh sometimes you hyper focus about very specific things that you don't quite know how they're going to relate to D&D &D. uh this isn't something I've told Monty about and it's also something that probably won't ever get published in our books but I did it anyway because I had to um I recently just wrote up a subclass called the portal knight and the reason I wrote up the portal knight subclass is because three to four weeks ago my brain just decided that the character of magic from Marvel Comics was the greatest character ever <laughs> written. I bought a bunch of magic comic books. I read the entire Wikipedia. I found, I watched the new Mutants movie, which was generally regarded as a terrible movie. I loved it because Anya Taylor-Joy played magic in it and I mean, she did an amazing Anya job. Anya Taylor-Joy. 
yeah and she was actually a perfect magic so i <laughs> that movie gets two thumbs up from me but i went hard i was just was like well i need to know everything about this character yeah. and then i used that to fuel a possible D D thing yeah uh so whatever your hyper focus is whatever it is that you're digging yeah. into use that to inspire your creativity Odie on Twitter said, spend most of your time on what motivates your brain the most. And I, I think that that's the real key takeaway here. It's like, find the thing that clicks and really allow that to be your, your, your fixation. Just apply diversity to that, right? Find lots of different things of that same oeuvre and let your brain just swim in it. Finally, again, we're broken records on this. Session, session zero. zero and the session re-zero as well really working with your group to establish your needs and the groups of the needs group roles and responsibilities discussing safety tools and figuring out the process and organization adults out of order said this on twitter safety tools frequent session zeros these kinds of check-ins are really important are really empowering and really really will help you navigate neurodiversity in, in D D as a dungeon master as a dungeon master when you have a session zero it's often to lay out and establish what the idea of the campaign is and what everybody's going to be playing but i think it's also important for you to express what your needs are as a dungeon master what responsibilities can you divvy out to the rest of the people at the table make sure that everybody's comfortable and understands what your needs are so that you can continue to give them the best game possible for everybody involved. Also, the session re-zero is a great way to constantly check in and make sure that everybody is still on the same page. Caleb on Twitter also pointed out, don't put the pressure of the player enjoyment all on yourself. Trust your players, and if you need to, don't be ashamed to check in with them to make sure everyone is having fun. And it's okay to need positive reinforcement. I need a lot of positive reinforcement. Monty knows this. He has to come into the office every day and tell me what a good job I'm doing. <laughs> so it's it's okay to need positive reinforcement. Yeah. And the, the session re-zero, or even after a session, being like, hey, everybody, what were your favorite parts of today's session? Did you have a good time? Um, and it's okay to need that. Yeah. Uh, players, thank you, Dungeon Masters. Like, really, really that, that acknowledgement goes a long way. And I, I think that it's also okay for Dungeon Masters to ask for that acknowledgement and in general also be allowed to take those breaks, whether that's breaks during the game or breaks from being the DM and getting on the other side of the screen or breaks from always playing D&D &D all the time and trying another system. Um, there's, there's so many different ways that the group can share this responsibility because I do, I really do believe that like, there is this undercurrent within our communities of um, dungeon masters are service providers. Mm. And that, unless you, unless you are a paid dungeon master, and even if you are a paid dungeon master, there's limits to that. But like, we always have this phrase, it's the DM's job to insert whatever thing that I think that you need, you must do in order to be a DM. And I really think that we need to remove that phrase from our lexicon because Again, unless you are getting paid, DMing is not a job, and it shouldn't be treated as a job, and it shouldn't carry that pressure that the Dungeon Master's responsibility is to be the social organizer, the cook, the like the one who has to clean up after the game session, the host of the event, the the social dynamic manager who has to navigate all the social dynamics of everybody at the table, the group therapist, the facilitator. And then also the dungeon master has to be a game designer who has to be a narrative writer, has to be totally creative. A character a, actor. A character actor has to also be um, completely original all the time, has to come up with scripts and dialogue that uh, compete with you know, the best writers and the and the and like media personalities and every and everything like that it's a lot of pressure and expectation that gets placed on dungeon masters and it's not fair um and so i think i think that there there is a a limit to that like yes as the dungeon master you are accepting a measure of responsibility for 
The, the, that will always be a, be a factor there, right? It's never going to not come with anything because that is part of the dynamic of how the medium works. But there, I do think that there is this kind of culture, uh, cu- cultural undertone that we have in a lot of TTRPG communities that the DM is supposed to be some kind of superhuman because the DM is God, right? But, yeah. but, but as a human being, you are not a God. You are, you are a person. You might want to be. Yeah. But you know, that, that, that kind of pressure and like so many things of like where people on, uh, online will like come down on DMs who are like, yeah, I find it really difficult to deal with like overpowered player characters. Or I find it really difficult to deal with characters that have flying or I'm really having trouble balancing my combat encounters. And then you get the person that writes this hundred page essay on how you are an oppressive dungeon master if you don't allow your player characters to have, uh, to, to fly and like it is your job to produce balanced encounters and challenge the players and it is always your job to be the one that is motivating the characters and providing the narrative and and that the players are just there to be the consumers of D &D rather than participants in a group activity and honestly i do think that that's why it's really important to have the session zero Mm -hmm. and to share the responsibilities and to be honest with your group and i have found that over the years i've grown to have my group be a very collaborative experience where i now feel like there's a lot less pressure on me because i'm bouncing off of the players at the table erica lowe on Twitter, who also just uh, happened to be the DM of our uh, Ragnarok campaign and was an amazing one of the authors master, of Ragnarok. and one of the authors of Ragnarok, uh, said on Twitter, "Be upfront and honest with your players about your limitations. If names give you trouble, change the name in the module if you need to. Your players won't notice or care. People are understanding and supportive." Um, so there, there are a lot of aspects of the game that might be difficult yeah. for you if you are neurodivergent. You might have a hard time with numbers. You might have a hard time with words. You might have a hard time keeping focused. The goal of this whole episode and the people in our community is that there are ways to navigate these in a way that's going to work for you at your table. That brings us to the end of our tips and tricks, but there's a lot more tips and tricks out there. And I want to once again, shout out the amazing people on, tw- on Twitter who allowed us to use their quotes in this episode, but there were hundreds of quotes so if you're not following us on twitter or you don't even have to follow us just head, check out the thread head yeah. over there there's a recent thread where we simply asked what are your best tips for neurodivergent dms and we have over hundreds of tips and tricks given in that thread on ways to navigate being a dm when you're neurodivergent but there's a lot of other tools out there as well neurodivergence manifests in different people in different ways and everybody's going to build a different toolbox what works for us might not work for you but through conversation we can share our tools and everybody can come away from those conversations equipped with strategies that they can try out for themselves I learned a lot in preparing for this episode simply by asking our community what their best tips were. There was a lot of stuff that they said that actually made me feel more confident and better about the ways I DM and the struggles that I have. So what I'd love for everybody out there to do is in the comments section of this video, leave your best tips and best advice for neurodivergent DMs. Similar to what we did on Twitter, I would love if the space below this video turns into a place where people watching this video can then go to see a whole arrangement of different tools that they can walk away from to feel encouraged to bring to their games. So please tell us your best DM neuro divergent advice in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our community by following the links down below. And you can check us out at Playing D&D in our actual play campaign in the worlds of Drakenheim, which is Tuesday evenings right here on YouTube. You can check out all the previous episodes right up over here. And don't forget to check out our Monsters of Drakenheim Kickstarter, which is live now. Links are down below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in in the the dungeon. dungeon.